Here we go, church. The book of Revelation, chapter 10 and verse 6, John said that time is no longer. Time is no longer because the days have been shortened. Time is being no longer will God hold back judgment for sin. Neither will he restrain evil. And we see that in the book of Revelation 7, 1, when we see the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds that they don't blow upon the earth. And we see that the uh, restrainer being the Holy Spirit, being the seven seals, is no longer holding back the judgment of what's coming upon the earth. In the book of Revelation 6, 1 and 2. So in the end times, the end times will unfold. It will run their course. There'll be no more restrainer, no more restraints. And we see that. One, the heavens are being opened and the things that were held back, that were sealed, are being loosened. The angel with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. This shows us the power and the authority of the rule and the reign of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ because 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26 tells us that Christ, that at the coming of the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdoms to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, verse 25, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So that's what John is seeing in a vision when he sees that this is at the end. That time is no longer. There's no more restraints. What's going to be will be. And he sees the reign of Christ because Christ has to rule and reign for a thousand years. One day to put the enemy underfoot. To complete the rule and the reign of Adam with his church, his bride, his wife. Christ cannot rule and reign in the thousand year reign without the bride of Christ. He needs his body with him. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, and we are members of his body, Ephesians 5 and 30. So the sea beast in Revelation 13 and 1 is certainly the power and the authority of the government of the Gentile and the beast over the nations. The earth, the beast rising up out of the earth in Revelation 13 and 11, the lamb with two horns is certainly representing the church and false doctrine and his power and authority as a lamb with two horns, the power of church and state. In the book of Revelation 16 to 14, we will see the conflict, the battle against Satan and the power and the authority over the nations and the battle for the earth. The mysteries of God will be finished. God's mystery is finished. God has finished his work. He finished his work on the seventh day. That's what Genesis 2 and 1 tells us. God ended is exactly what the word says. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 2. It said God ended his work. What do we see here? God indeed ended his work on the seventh, on the seventh seal, on the seventh trumpet, on the, on the seventh bowl. God ended his work on the seventh. He certainly kept his word, didn't he? He ended it. And we know that the mysteries during the seven trumpet judgment also we see in the book of Joshua chapter 10. Because the angel says time is no longer in Revelations 10 and 6. Well, we know by Joshua chapter 10 that Joshua asked God to cause the moon and the sun to stand still so he and his army could fight by daylight. And God helped Joshua by calling a powerful storm with rain and hell stone. So we know that God did help Joshua. But Joshua said that it was for vengeance. And that's exactly what we're going to see when time is no longer. When the time ends, God is going to do it the exact same thing. Thing that he did for Joshua he's going to do for the Lord Jesus Christ and his army in Joel 2 and 11 
The Lord is on the earth, uttering his voice before his army. He is in Jerusalem. Because Amos 1 and 2 establishes that word with us in Joel 3 and 16. He is uttering his voice from Jerusalem. So, church, in the book of Matthew, I'm sorry, in the book of Revelation 19 and 13 and 14, we know the army of the Lord is the church, and we know we are with Christ at his return. We know in Luke 19 and 27, Jesus said the enemies of Jesus Christ, those that refuse him as king, will be killed before him. These be the days of vengeance. Luke 18 and 7, Revelation 6 and 10. Here we go, church. Zechariah 14 and 1. Zechariah sees that Jerusalem is taken. Luke 21, 23, 24. Revelation 11 and 2. It is given to the Gentiles to tread them under their feet, to trample the grapes, because this is the devil's wrath. Revelation 12, 12 and 17. Zechariah 14 and 3, the great prophet of God foresaw the Lord's return to the Mount of Olives in the book of Acts 1, 9 through 12. So the Lord will battle. That's what Joel 2 and 11, Revelations 19, 13 and 14, and he will fight against the nations that fought against Jerusalem. We see that in the book of Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 1 through 13, we see the victory of Zion. She is singing and rejoicing before the Lord. And that is exactly what we see in the book of Revelation 7 and 9, those that are rejoicing with palms in their hands. Leviticus 23 and 40 establishes that word with us, that the palms in their hands, they will go and rejoice before the Lord for seven days, keeping the feast of the Lord. Read the book of John 12. Verses 12 and 13, they are rejoicing before the Lord of the feast. Now, I like this part right here because it is revelation knowledge, and I believe that God did not have the prophet lead this out because it is so prophetic and revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit of God in the book of Zechariah 2 and 13. One, he said, Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord. For he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If it got any better than this, I don't think I could take it, church. Psalms 132 verses 13 and 14 says that Zion is the place of the rest of God. It is his habitation. This is his place where he will rest forever. He said he has desired it. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23, Mount Zion is the church of the firstborn. Colossians 1 and 18, the firstborn from the dead. Because Christ has raised the dead. Not only the Old Testament saints, but at his return, Christ will raise the dead. And we know that even after the thousand year reign of Christ, the dead will be raised again in the book of Revelation 20 and 7. So the dead will live again. Rather, now we know that us, the church, we will be raised at the first of the beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ. Revelation 20 and 4, we will rule and reign with him. But we know that others will be raised at the end of that thousand year reign. Also read the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 and through 22 on the habitation of God, this is amazing revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit of God. And here we go, church. It is a day of vengeance is what it is at the return of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 through 9. In a flaming fire, Jesus and his angels, taking vengeance on them that know not God and those that did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will be punished. Zechariah 14, 9 through 19, a plague. Whether it be a plague of zombies or not, Zechariah 14 and 12 definitely established that good word with us that the flesh will be consumed away while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes will be consumed and their tongue will be consumed away in their mouth. So the enemies of Jerusalem, not only the enemies of Jerusalem, but the animals themselves will rot. It is a plague. And 
and even their in their animals will suffer the same plague. So it is a time of panic, moving them to kill one another. And Zechariah, certainly the prophet of God, foresaw the day when the whole earth will know the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of the whole earth, the true and living God. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And they will bow before him. In the day, Jerusalem will be the place of God's reign and how the Lord will defeat the enemies of Jerusalem in Zechariah 14, 9 through 11. So Zion has a lot to sing and rejoice about. For her, Lord and Savior, her king is strong as iron and Zion's feet are brass and she will trample her enemies also under her feet. The Lord sent the plagues to the Egyptians in the book of Exodus 9 and 14. Numbers 14 and 37 tells us how the spies brought back the report of how they died by plagues before the Lord. That's the mighty hand of God right there, church. Make no mistakes about it. We serve a mighty God who's able to do and beyond what we ask of him. And I like it when Moses is standing in front of that sea and he tells these people to stand still to see the mighty hand of God. Because I tell you what, God has not revealed his right hand yet, but he's about to. I'm telling you, he's about to reveal it to the whole entire world. God sent plagues to strike the nations that attacked Jerusalem, the holy city of God. The pearls of God which are holy, are not to be given unto the dogs and swines. But nevertheless, they will trample them under their feet for three and a half years. So the attack on Jerusalem, God will fight for Jerusalem. She will become a seat of power and great authority in Jesus Christ's kingdom. Isaiah 33 and 5, Psalms 110. I tell you, church, for this reason, God will destroy all her enemies. And their flesh will rot. It will decay. It will waste away. And the prophet Zechariah reveals the plague upon man and animals in Zechariah 14, 12, and 15. The plague on animals, Exodus 12 and 29, as well as the people. The blast is called, listen to this church, listen to this. I want you to pay attention to this right here that Zechariah is definitely trying to establish this word with us who this beast is. Now, there will be a great noise, a blast will happen in the last days because the heaven and earth is being destroyed and burning at the same time the earth is and how things are going to pass away with a great fervent heat because God is not playing any longer and he is not restraining his judgment nor his wrath. He is pouring it out upon the people and that's why the angel in Revelation 10 and 6 is trying to establish that word with us. It's done. Prepare now. There's no more restraints. There's no more delays. There's no more restrainer. It is all out war. This is it. No one is holding back their forces. The sons of light battling the sons of darkness. Now Zechariah is trying to establish with us. And so is Micah 5 and 5. That the beast is called the Assyrian. The image of the future beast and false prophet and the attack upon Jerusalem, you'll see that that in Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, when Jerusalem is taken because it is a great siege upon these people. The enemy is coming to take us full. And certainly Micah 5 and 5, he does establish that word with us that he is calling the beast the Assyrian. And we know that Abraham came out of our rock. So just keep that in your mind, church. And speaking of zombies and thinking out loud, because, church, you're, you don't understand that all these things are going to unfold. And when they start unfolding, there's nothing that's going to hold them back. And I know that we have seen enough of delays in, in our lifetime of seeing things going into a boiling point, And then it seems like that something is restraining them and it's cooling down. 
And make no mistakes about it, that day is coming that God is no longer going to restrain and hold back anything. And a lot of people say that because when the church is ascended up, the Holy Spirit goes. No, church, the Holy Spirit is not going anywhere. That would say that God is a respecter of persons. And why would God send the Holy Spirit out of here when the 144,000 that are sealed are sealed until the day of redemption by the power of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4 and 30? And we know how are they going to preach and, and how are they going to do anything without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not going anywhere. He's not leaving the earth. He will still be on the earth. That was one thing he made clear to me. He will always be here where there is light, where there is the oil, where there are those that are standing for the truth, those that are dying for the word of God, those that are willing to make a stand. Do you hear me, church? Those that love not their lives unto the death, that truly love the kingdom of God that are willing to fight for their Lord and their Savior, Jesus Christ. Because you see, this all belongs to him anyway. And he's coming for battle to take back what the enemy stole from Adam. And the devil is all about taking it by force, right? So we see, or we think, and I think, and I was thinking out loud also about what Zechariah sees about the flesh rotting away and the eyes being consumed while they're standing upon their feet made us think of zombies. Until the Holy Spirit of God revealed to me in the book of Daniel 12 and 2 when he said, Would this not make you think of the prophecy of the resurrection of the dead that some will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt? And while I was looking at that, I thought, Well, wait a minute. We know that uh, when Jesus raised Lazarus, uh, Lazarus didn't have a glorified body. We don't know if Lazarus died. There's no record that Lazarus died, but the Pharisees believed that they wanted to kill him because of it caused the people to believe in the power of Jesus Christ because he raised the dead, Lazarus, in four days. And it made a lot of people think also that is that how long the spirit and the soul takes trying to get back into the body for days. That'll make you think also, won't it, church? It really will. So the Holy Spirit of God revealed to me this would be the place of the rotten flesh of the dead, would it not? So I looked at Daniel 12 and 2 as led by the Holy Spirit of God that some were raised to shame and everlasting content. Revelation 16 and 15, it got me thinking, church, because everything the Holy Spirit of God gives me, he is laying a foundation. So I went on over there to the book of Revelation 16 and 15, and Jesus said at his return to keep your garments, lest you walk naked and they see your shame. Well, Daniel 2, 12 and 2 tells us that they are raised to shame and everlasting contempt. Because 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 3 establishes that word with us about the earthly tabernacle being dissolved. And that we groan to be clothed upon with our house from heaven. Verse 3, if so, we will not be found naked. That means without a house. Verse 4, this tabernacle, this earthly one, does groan. Being burdened, not that we be unclothed, but clothed that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And we see in the book of Jude 1 and 23, the garment of flesh. And we also see in the book of Joshua about Joshua and the filthy garment that does show us they are guilty of sin. That's what it reveals to us. So the dead being raised in Daniel 12 and 2 and Revelation 20 and 7, after the thousand year reign of Christ, they are raised to shame and everlasting contempt. They would definitely be the zombies, wouldn't they, church? Though the ones that have the rotten, stinking flesh. Even uh, one of Lazarus' sisters said to Christ that Lazarus stinks. 
Now that'll make you think, church. I'm telling you, if that don't get you to thinking, I don't know what will. This is amazing revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit of God. It is the butter and the honey on the bread. It is the meat in due season. It is the good stuff. Amen. It is the good stuff. So when the Holy Spirit of God led me to Daniel 12 and 2, I certainly agreed with him. That was exactly what we were seeing. The rottenness of the dead flesh of sin. The apostle said that who shall deliver me from the body of this death? They cannot be delivered from the body of that death. Truly, that is Revelations chapter 9. Those that desire to die in death uh, flees from you. And those that are cast alive in the lake of fire, because it's repetition, there's day and night. They are bound by time. And they cannot escape time because time is an illusion. And what they feared most is what come upon them. And they are living for eternity in their sins and the wages of sin is death it is torment it is the the scorpion sting of death but yet death flees from them they are in the rottenness and the shame and the everlasting contempt of their own flesh no wonder they are gnawing off their tongues in the lake of fire because it is a place of torment and repetition. Because when it's day, it'll be night. When the morning comes again, it will repeat itself. They cannot escape that loop of time. Even though the Holy Spirit of God uh, revealed to me that Daniel 7 and 25 is certainly the enemy trying to escape that loop of time. They want out of it, church. I'm telling you, they do. That loop of time is almost as if it binds them within that dream state. It does. It holds them within that illusion. You see, for us, time is no longer. God is not holding us within this reality of this metrics. All right, Holy Spirit, I'm not going to go on any longer. I, I will go on, my Lord. I'm going to go on, church. The Holy Spirit of God is saying, don't go into the depth of that word. So I will move on. In the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. Church, we know that God has forgiven us. We are washed, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. But to those that have not accepted the great gift of salvation, and those that have taken the mark of the beast, the number of the beast, are guilty. And their garment is flesh. And they will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. Because their righteousness is filthy rags. That's their righteousness. Our righteousness is the righteousness of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelations 19, 7 and 8, the righteousness of the bride. Remember Abraham. Abraham believed God in the book of Romans, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So his righteousness and the righteousness of the bride is faith, faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ. So we're putting on the garment that's white and clean in holiness, not because of your works, church, but because of the works of Jesus Christ. Remember Ephesians 5, 27 through 30. You are members of his body. And he is without spot, blemish, and wrinkle. And he is holy. And you are holy. And he is presenting himself with his own body. Oh, wow, the things I could tell you about that, Lord. See, I, I come up against this when I'm teaching I know so much more than that, but I will leave it at that, Holy Spirit, because I don't want you to have to go and look at all those scriptures that I certainly could take you to to establish this word with you. It is just amazing, just amazing revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit of God. Search out those scriptures, church. If you love me and you're my friend, search out those scriptures. Get the word out. Light the candle and search out that good treasure because it is 
I tell you, I know some stuff by the Holy Spirit, my best friend. So we know that we will be changed in a twinkle of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet. And that ain't no accident right there either, church, because Revelations 10 and 6, it is the last trumpet when the mysteries of God are finished. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I show you a great mystery. Yes, you see, do you see how that word just goes into place? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, God will establish his word. And Hebrews 12 and 1 tells us that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. I could teach on that all day long too, church. This is amazing word. Amazing. So you think on these things, my dear precious friends today, think on these things. Have a blessed and victorious day today in Jesus Christ's most holy name we pray. And let the church say amen and amen. Also read the book of Micah 5 and 5. Michael's definitely going to tell us some things about the beast that uh, certainly is revelation knowledge. But all of the prophets of God. And here I am in the year 2024 teaching revelation knowledge by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And these great men of God, these prophets of God, saw the future in visions. And the Holy Spirit, you know he was there too. God revealed these things to them, so they knew it. They had that revelation knowledge way before I ever got it. It's just amazing because they're the witnesses, and I need those witnesses. I certainly do. <laughs> I need those witnesses. Have a blessed day, church. You are always on my heart and always in my prayers, and keep me in yours. I love you, my dear, dear, precious friends. Have a blessed and victorious day today. In Jesus Christ's most holy name we pray, and let the church say amen and amen. I hope you are blessed by this word. But church, I tell you, the day is coming. All of this is going to end. There's going to be a blast in heaven. Everything is going to pass away. The heavens and the earth are going to burn. And God's going to usher in that new age. And we'll see what takes place from here after that. Because it never ends. That was something the Holy Spirit told me. You think it ends. It never ends, church. He's going to allow me to tell you this little part and I'll tell you. But I won't go into detail. There is never an end to anything. There's an end of that age. There's an end of that dispensation of that time, of what's in that realm. God puts an end to it. But there's actually not an end. He will always start again. And certainly it is amazing. It really is amazing, the plan of God and how God does that. Because the Holy Spirit of God said to me, when I said, why is God steady doing this? He said, why not, my friend? He is an eternal being. He is a creator. This is what he does. He creates worlds. And he creates scenarios and multi-universes and many dimensions, parallel universes. And he works and moves through all of his creation and every creation. He prepared himself a body so he could be one with that creation. You as an eternal being, and you are an eternal being, the body is not you. The being that is inside of you is the true life form. You're eternal. You cannot die. And because of this, God continues to create realities, worlds, dimensions, parallel universes, gateways that connect to other worlds for your pleasure, for his pleasure. But the greatest power of the spirit that's within you is that your memory is removed. 
because to play a game, you want to go into the game with no knowledge. But learn as you go to show the strength of the warrior of the spirit that is within you. That you can show God that this is the power of the knowledge that you having everything whopped away coming into the realm naked came into the world naked I, you'll go naked came in here with nothing you'll go with nothing but the power of who you are is gaining power within that realm within that matrix the matrix is powerful it is so powerful that if the first sign of the power of the metrics is that you awake in the metrics. That's the power of it because so many are asleep. They really are. Oh, man, I could tell you some stuff on that one right there alone on how many are asleep. And all they do is they, all, they stay within that dream state and they never wake out of it to see the truth that's behind that reality that's it within that realm. But that's the strength of who you are and to be able to control the elements that's within the womb, within the metrics that you can control. And the Holy Spirit is trying to teach me and which it's taken me a little longer than I thought, but it is not as easy as you think to be able to use your mind to rise above what the flesh is telling you. To know that you are a spiritual being and you have to be able to take that spiritual being of who you are, the true you, and rise above even the very flesh. Like a lot of times when I'm in pain or, or, or my body's hurting or I'm sick, the first thing the Holy Spirit of God will say to me, my friend, rise above. Do not become one with this. Do not allow it to overpower you. You have the power to overcome this if you will rise above it to know that you are not one with this body, that you have been divided by the word of God and separate. You've been placed separate from the flesh. Take authority over it. Learn to rise above it. That's not as easy as he says it is. But uh, I'm trying my best, church, so you be praying for me on that one. But uh, as I go into my prayer closet and I spend that time with the Holy Spirit of God, I believe that is exactly what he has been teaching me, to focus more on God and the heavenly things than on the earthly things. And uh, it's amazing. Oh, I could tell you some stuff, church. I tell you, it would carry your hair. If the Holy Spirit of God would just let me go and tell everything. Because I have a lifetime of walking with God. And it is an amazing journey that I thank God for. I do. I thank Him for it every day. Lord, don't let me cry. I'm going to let you go, church. Because you give me enough of time to talk. And I will keep talking because the wine is always a flowing the wine is always pouring out of me i'm telling you glory hallelujah thank you jesus and you get that anointing of that holy spirit and won't nothing hold me back i'm telling you won't nothing hold me back because i can talk especially about the good word and the treasures of heaven well, I love you, church, and I better let you go. My time is always a ticking. You have a blessed day, my friends.